Good morning. I'll call the uh, RTC meeting of April 14th, 2022 to order. MJ. Good morning, Chairwoman and members of the commission. Your first item is to conduct your first citizens participation period. Thank you. This is the first time set aside for public comment. This time is limited to comments on, on items included on the agenda. Those wishing to speak on a posted item, now is your opportunity. Please come forward to the microphone and provide your comments. State your name for the record. And I have a couple of cards here. First, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yes. Good morning, I'm Catherine Duncan, um, 1001 F Street, Las Vegas, Nevada, good morning. I'm here to speak on all items on the agenda that have to deal with capital improvement and infrastructure. And I understand this organization is responsible for planning the overall infrastructure for the whole region. And because transportation is such an important component of our future planning and has such an impact on everything we do, we would really like for this Metropolitan Planning Organization to help guide us through a virtual community action plan so that we can do an overall plan that involves the water, the sewer, the transportation, the health care, the schools. Um, this is so that we can address the Justice 40 initiative. I'm sure you've all heard of the Justice 40 initiative that requires 40% of all capital and infrastructure funds to benefit the disadvantaged community. And so last time you talked a lot about how you would involve the disadvantaged communities and you use words like assessment and engagement, evaluation, analysis and planning. But we wonder if you really have any way to do that. If you have any systems in place that allows you to accomplish those missions. We're following two models, Kansas City and Los Angeles, where they've actually done it using children. So we'd like for you to join with us and sponsor us as we involve, when I say we, we're the Harrison House and the West Side Neighborhood Association, as we involve ourselves in a virtual community action planning process and as Commissioner Segerblom asked for scenarios. Can we get some different scenarios so that we don't build incorrectly so that we have to tear down and rebuild? So if there's a way for us to move forward, could you provide MJ with your contact information so that we can, yeah, you've been talking. <laughs> Thank Wonderful. you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. I have a card from a Bob Smith. Good morning, Chairwoman Marsh and fellow commissioners, MJ and Francis. Um, Bob Smith, for the record, general manager for MV on the fixed route side, and I just wanted to say thank you very much for considering items 31 through 33, which would provide retention bonuses for our hardworking mechanics, road supervisors, and dispatchers who work tire, tire, tirelessly through the pandemic. I certainly appreciate the partnership and the leadership that this board, as well as RTC, has shown during these difficult period and I want you to know how much our drivers appreciated the retention bonus that was paid last month. And I am very confident that our su support staff would appreciate the bonuses equally as much. Uh, thank you again for your consideration. Have a great day. Thank Thanks. you, Bob. Next is Donna Clark. Oh, can we bring a microphone up there? Thank you. Okay, uh, good morning, Madam Chairperson and members of the RTC Board. My name is Donna Clark. I have been a consumer of RTC for 26 years without complaint, accident, or incident until, is this mic still on? Until yes. October 26th. And I'll just read you a short letter that I uh, wrote to the Mob Museum. Madam Goodman, I am not clear on how I fell on October 26, 2021, while waiting for the paratransit bus at 855. It happened all at once. It seemed like it just happened over the course of just a few minutes. Suddenly, I was face down on the ground, shocked, dazed, and confused. Again, I am not clear on what caused my fall. It is very important that I don't speculate if I don't have the facts. I am requesting to review the video surveillance on what triggered my fall on October 26, 2021 at 8.55 p.m. face down on the ground. And this happened at the Mob Museum. Uh, someone from 
security called me back and for the, because of time and I don't want to go through everything. I also uh, asked if there was a, if it was a board that I can go before to talk about this and to file a complaint. I also talked to the paratransit manager and here, here, here at, at the RTC meeting, because I was going to come before you then, and they assured me that they were going to investigate uh, the stop at the Mob Museum. And at the time, it was in the alley, there was no lights, there was nowhere to sit, and the bus was in the wrong place. And I'm sure they've made those corrections now. Um, instead, when I called Mr. Kenny Rodriguez to ask about the complaint, he told me that the RTC wasn't responsible for that stop, and, and he gave me a list of the board members that I could call. The CFO of the Mob Museum, even before Mr. Rodriguez said I could do this, told me that the board meetings were closed. So why am I here? Because I was never, I was given the, the statements that I made by me and the bus driver, but they never gave me what they found when they went to go investigate the Mob Museum. Again, I've been a member, I've been a consumer of RTC for 26 years. I take this bus to work as a, a member of IOTC Local 720 on the bounce. I've caught this bus all times of days, all hours of night. As a school teacher, I went to every school in this district on that bus. And it's very sad that this is my first complaint and the manner in which I was treated. Thank you so very much for your, your valuable time. And I'd like to say to the mayor of Henderson, I went to 200 Water Street. What a class act. Thank you. And thank you. Um, I will ask staff to get with you before you leave today to. Well, uh, I have to go because I have. Oh, you to, do? Can someone run I up have there to go to therapy, you? but I have my printouts of my, 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 my when I talk to the people at the Mob Museum and Kenny Rodriguez, it's just one statement, but proof that I did fall and from the fire department who never showed up. And the reason why they said they never showed up, it was based on the information they was given when I fell. So it's established that I did fall. And, and I can't tell you how afraid and scared I was that night. I really can't tell you how much so I was. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We'll have someone speak to you. Thank you. Thank you for coming in. Is there anyone else wishing to speak in the public comment period? Seeing no one, we'll go ahead and move on to the next item. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, the next item is to approve the agenda. It's in order and ready for your approval. Any questions or comments, or can I have a motion to approve the agenda? So we have a motion on the floor. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Is Commissioner Galt on the phone? Commissioner Galt? Yes. Okay, anyone opposed, say nay. And that motion carries, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, the next item is to receive this, the uh, CEO report. And in lieu of our standard contractor recognition, we wanted to highlight the efforts of all of our transit workers during Transit Worker Appreciation Month. The RTC, along with Keolis, MV Transportation, and Marksman Security, celebrated Transit Worker Appreciation Month to thank our contracted transit workers for, the, for keeping Southern Nevada moving and connecting the community to vital resources. Uh, these workers are the drivers, mechanics, custodians, and security guards who get our community where they need to, to be and keep them safe along the way. To show our appreciation, the RTC hosted pop-up events at each of the contractor's locations and passed out treats, prizes, and discounts to local restaurants, including Marsigliano's Pizzeria, Letty's, Foku Burger, and more. Additionally, Keolis MV and Tango car drivers, mechanics and supervisors are especially appreciative to the board for the retention incentives and thankful for your support and leadership. And we're thankful to all of those yes, workers who keep amazing. our system running. That's Thank right. you very much. And while one of our roles, the RTC, is to provide transportation options, we have long-standing partnerships with many community organizations that provide social services for the underserved. And we're always looking for ways to create synergy with our efforts. Access to fresh produce and social services is important in downtown Las Vegas, so we are especially excited to bring back the veggie buck truck and welcome the Nevada Homeless Alliance pop-up events at the Bonneville Transit Center. 
The veggie buck truck was so popular last year that it was a very easy decision to ask them to return again this year. And actually it was so popular that they, they ran out of produce within 45 minutes. So uh, note to wow. self when we, we do this again next month. Uh, shoppers there, they can get fresh produce, uh, including fruits and vegetables for a dollar a pound, as well as a free insulated reusable grocery tote to ensure that the produce stays cool on their commute home. The first veggie buck truck pop-up was held last week and approximately 160 pounds of food were sold. The events will continue on the first Wednesday of each month in May, June, September, October, and November. Additionally, we are excited to share that the Nevada Homeless Alliance is bringing their social services to the BTC next Tuesday, April 19th. This event is in partnership with the Southern Nevada Housing Authority, Southern Nevada Transit Coalition, Opportunity Village, and Clark County Social Services, who will offer resources related to housing assistance, uh, medical care, employment support, and hygiene care. So we are really um, happy to support these truly meaningful events that help the most vulnerable in our community. And in light of the recent rise in gas prices and in celebration of Earth Month, the RTC has implemented a month-long campaign to promote our club ride program and educate our community on ways they can save money, reduce congestion, and help our environment through alternative commutes. So the campaign will run until April 30th and offers free incentives for commuters who participate in the program and report their trips like riding transit, carpooling, walking, bicycling, motorcycling, and telecommuting. As part of the campaign, Residents who sign up for Club Ride or existing Club Ride members will receive 14 free days of transit service, free carpool match reports, and 30 days of free RTC bike share. They can also enter to win raffle prizes, including two $50 gas gift cards every week during the month of April. Uh, within the first week of the campaign, we received more than 420 signups for the program and 110 carpool match reports. And by extending these free services, we are able to provide some relief to Southern Nevadans during this time, while also educating them about the cost-effective options they have to travel throughout the valley. Now I'll hand it over to Deputy CEO David Swallow. He's going to provide you with an update on the progress of our roadway funding. This is our annual, uh, this is our quarterly report to you, and it includes uh, fuel tax and sales tax. Dave. Thank you, MJ. Mr. Right. Swallow. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. So I'm excited to talk to you about the progress we've made on our, our roadway funding program. Uh, to date, since 2014, as you can see on the slide, we've started 592 projects with uh, 335 of those completed to date. We still have 148 in design, 109 in construction, and we're looking forward to new projects coming online as part of the capital improvement program that you approved last year. When you look at the total, con the total dollars spent under these contracts, it's pretty impressive. Um, you can see here to date, we have uh, have nearly $2 billion under contract since 2014 uh, when the fuel revenue indexing program was initiated. That also, in that's a combined motor vehicle fuel tax, so the base nine cents per gallon, along with the FRI one and FRI two. You also see that we have nearly $92 million in sales tax, that's uh, part of our question 10. Uh, that also goes to roadway projects and also for trail projects and other improvements. So quite a bit of resources, a sustainable funding resource that we've had to date uh, to support those efforts. When you look at what's under contract, um, cumulatively we have, like I said, almost $2 billion, $1.97 billion in projects uh, under contract. And to date, uh, the, the local jurisdictions have spent about $1.4 So those are the actual expenses we, that we've invoiced, but we, we certainly have invoices coming in every week. Uh, the other part of it, though, if you look at the revenue, and this, this also considers uh, future bonding, we have about $2.2 billion available in our, in our uh, total program to date. When you, the other really important part of this is how many jobs this has supported. And cumulatively, we're estimating that over 13,000 jobs have either uh, been directly, indirectly, or induced by these uh, different roadway projects. And I think that speaks to when the program was cr created and why it was created and really the results we've seen to date. I also want to highlight what projects have been completed this last quarter. If you look at the first up is City North Las Vegas, we have a couple projects. First is at North 5th and Centennial Parkway. Uh, this project included some <coughs> intersection improvements and repaving of the roadways. Um, 
the other, uh, also some ADA improvements in that area. I think total uh, project was just over 500,000. Another one is uh, street improvements on Hammer Lane uh, between Flying Arrow Place to Simmons Street. These also were, um, oh, I, I apologize, the last one was 1.8 million on the mm -hmm. North 5th and Centennial. Uh, the the Hammer, Hammer Lane also had some uh, asphalt improvements and the addition of sidewalks for better access for, for pedestrians, restriping of the road and some utility adjustments. Uh, that total project cost was 287,000. Next, I'd like to highlight City of Henderson. First up is street improvements from on Pecos Ridge Parkway from Eastern to Sunridge Heights Parkway and on Coronado Center Drive to St. Rose Parkway. Uh, the first project kicked off in July of last year with improvements to Pecos Ridge Parkway. And then uh, we also, the City of Henderson also undertook replacing the sidewalk ramps and up, upgrading to meet ADA uh, requirements. Also, uh, new pavement markings. The total project cost was about $3 million. Another project in the city of Henderson, really uh, transformative one, I think, was the repaving of Stephanie Street. Uh, this is one that began in March of 2021. It stretched from I-215 to the Union Pacific Railroad, and then uh, Dollar Loan Center at Green Valley Parkway and Paseo Verde Parkway. The improvements included pavement re rehabilitation on Stephanie Street and the addition of a fourth southbound through lane. Uh, Wigwam Parkway and I-215 westbound ramps also received intersection improvements, including traffic signal modifications, additional sidewalk ramps, and pavement markings. Uh, some of the roadway improvements on Green Valley Parkway and Paseo, Vedo, Paseo Verde Parkway were made to support the new Dollar Loan Center and, and the arena there, including the addition of new pavement, ITS, or Intelligent Transportation System devices, uh, and three signals, including Green Valley Parkway and Paseo Verde Parkway. Uh, I think that's where we're looking at that uh, we have some adaptive signal control that's been implemented to hopefully help with the I'll events. Uh, th this project wrapped up in February at a total cost of $5.85 million. Finally, I wanted to highlight one for the City of Mesquite. Uh, this is half roadway improvements, Falcon Ridge Parkway and Horizon Boulevard. Uh, the improvements included the construction of new roadway on Falcon Ridge Parkway and Horizon Boulevard between Canyon Crest Boulevard and Sidewinder Drive. Project added nearly 1.3 miles of road grading, curb gutter, and sidewalks, along with asphalt paving and street lights. It wrapped up in February 2022 at a cost of approximately $3 million. One last thing I wanted to highlight uh, this week is the National Work Zone Awareness Week. Um, a number of us are wearing orange to help highlight and remind people that the work zones are out there. And we know that everybody likes to drive safely, but be particularly cautious when you're around work zones to be mindful of the changes in traffic control and also for the people out there working trying to be safe. And that concludes this report. Thank you, Mr. Swallow. Anything else, MJ? That is the conclusion of your report. If you have any questions. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Commissioner? Well, as we were talking, um, I just want to say I visited Boulder City this week. And um, according to our councilwoman, uh, the incoming part of Boulder City is due to RTC, and it is gorgeous. So I'm not sure when you did that, but it is, you really did a fantastic job. So thank you. Thank you, and I, and I would like to comment too that the we are learning from the artificial intelligence that's along Green Valley Parkway already, even with the, the increased traffic flow. I was there at the arena last night, and it, it, traffic is moving yeah. fairly quickly and mm -hmm. smoothly along that corridor, so good job, guys. <laughs> I, have, uh, I have a comment too. Yes. Yeah, um, I just, uh, this is something I, I keep bringing up in, in Boulder City also, is to continue to be aware of the difference between the uh, implications and letter of the ADA um, rules and, and structures. Um, it was pointed out to me earlier this year by a woman who is, is visually impaired in Boulder City, who has both a seeing eye dog and, and uses a stick, uh, that we have to be very careful about the what are they called, truncated cones? Truncated domes. 
And it's a very serious issue because I know in Boulder City, a number of them were installed at an angle in order to avoid having to put in two at a corner, which means that the person with the seeing eye dog and the dog is trained to look for those domes and with her stick, that it takes her out into the middle of traffic to go from one angular uh, cutout. Uh, the truncated domes are those yellow ramps with the, with the dots, uh, to the, the opposite corner, that that's where both her stick and her, her dog will take her. And I know that's something that's being fixed, but it's a continuous awareness of the fact that the letter of the ADA and the, the spirit may not, also, may not be in conjunction with each other. Um, and to, to close your eyes and think, well, where would you end up if you won't go down that ramp? Mm. So that. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? MJ? Oh, all right. Thank you, Chairwoman. Uh, the next item is to receive the Nevada Department of Transportation's director's report from Deputy Director Jeff LaRoud. Mr. LaRoud. Thank you. Um, good morning, I'm Jeff LaRue, Deputy Director with the Department of Transportation, and I'll be giving you the Director's Report today. As Director Swallow does every month, oh, this going. as Director Swallow does every month, I'm going to start the presentation with safety. Over the first quarter of 2022, we have seen a statewide decrease of nearly 14% compared to last year. Across all of Nevada, rates of fatalities went down in nearly every county with one notable exception, and that's Clark County which had a 23% increase in traffic fatalities from this same time last year. The rate of motorcyclist fatalities remain the same in the region. Pedestrian fatalities increased nearly 17% and bicyclist fatalities climbed 50%. Usually at these meetings, we tell you about a specific crash on, on the roadways in Southern Nevada, but instead we wanna start focusing more on what NDOT's doing to help prevent these crashes and help lower the statistics. One thing that we're working on to save lives is our wrong way driver alert system. In 2018, NDOT completed a large-scale system-wide traffic study of Southern Nevada. The study included data collection, travel demand forecasting, traffic modeling, alternatives development, and benefit cost analysis. As part of the study, NDOT installed 37 wrong-way driver alert systems in the state. Using radar technology, when the system senses a driver headed the wrong way on an off-ramp, it triggers a series of flashing lights and wrong-way signage. It, al it also records a short video clip of the wrong-way vehicle which is distributed in real time to law enforcement. During the study, we found that nearly 89% of the time the system was triggered, the wrong way driver turned around before entering the freeway. We are nearing the end of the study and have preliminary approval to continue building out the network. NDOT is currently in the bidding process and the next phase of wrong way driver alert system should begin breaking ground in early 2023. With the population of Southern Nevada continuing to grow rapidly, we expect an increase in traffic on freeways and interstates and anything we can do to help prevent crashes is essential. We hope that this proactive measure will save the lives of many people in the years to come. Like Mr. Swallow had this slide as well, uh, this week is National Work Zone Awareness Week, um, which is an annual campaign held at the start of the construction season to encourage safe driving through work zones. With many major highway improvement projects across the state, NDOT and our safety partners remind motors to drive safely in and around work zones. And from July 1st, 2020 through July 1st, 2021, there were, were 1,068 crashes and seven fatal crashes in work zones across the state. The big takeaway we want from this campaign is for drivers to use extra, extra caution in and around work zones. NDOT places work zone signage, reduced speed limits, temporary rumble strips, safety barriers, electronic radar speed, radar speed signs, overhead lighting, and much more to enhance the visibility and safety of work zones on our highways. And we need the public's help to help keep those workers safe. Everyone plays an important role in work zone safety. We hope that this week will bring extra attention to motorists and highlight the deadly dangers of inattention in work zone areas. It's been a week long commemoration, including a Go Orange Day at NDOT yesterday, where our team was encouraged to wear orange to work. Uh, personally, I was able to show off my orange Minnesota Vikings hat, so I was really excited about that. Um, we also saw some tweets and social posts from state and local leadership joining in to promote awareness. We encourage, or excuse me, we urge the board and public to remember that people whose lives were lost in work zone incidents use caution, focus on the road, and slow down in and around work zones.
Now on to the advisory working group on long-term sustainable transportation funding. The advisory working group, which I'll refer to as AWG, met in person earlier this week on Tuesday, April 12th in Reno. As the AWG enters the most challenging part of this study, that is settling on recommended transportation revenue options for the future, they hope that like last month, having, an, having everyone together for those discussions would make it easier for the group to deliberate and move forward. They've been doing a deep dive into near-term, long-term, and flexible funding mechanisms to be advanced for additional consideration and more detailed analysis. The research that has been on the, these funding mechanisms includes financial, including collection costs, consisting of calculations of what these mechanisms raise, the impact by household, and expected implementation costs. This should help the group decide what me mechanism should be included in a funding package recommendation by better understanding the impacts of each me mechanism and their trade-offs. The research into policy consisted of performance against AWG guiding principles, as well as documenting the remaining issues that must be addressed for near-term adoption and for longer-term uh, transition. As reported last month, a lengthy list of mechanisms were considered. Near-term mechanisms that received consensus this week will be analyzed and included indexing fuel excise tax statewide and increasing value-based GST. The following, although they didn't receive consensus, there was also strong support for a delivery fee on tangible goods and increasing the base vehicle licensing fee. No specific rates or implementation dates have been recommended yet. Long-term mechanisms that achieved consensus and will be analyzed further included the same revenue me mechanisms identified for near-term funding needs, except instead of relying on the gas tax in future years for transportation funding, there was strong support to transition to a road usage charge for passenger vehicles. Last, flexible funding sources for the group identified for further analysis are increasing the GST and a parcel delivery fee. A carbon tax did not make the shortlist for potential statewide funding sources, but nonetheless, the group wanted some additional research to proceed, so that will be, so that will be continued. Land use impact fees and street utility fees were also identified as sources worth consideration, but were determined to be suited uh, better for local implementation. The AWG worked very hard this week and will continue into their next meeting on June 14th. The overall study remains on schedule. The AWG is optimistic that an outline of the recommendations for future transportation funding mechanisms can be reached by the conclusion of the June meeting, which would allow for, which would allow formal report drafting and, re, and refinements to happen into the early fall and an on-time delivery to the legislature later in 2022. Now for our update on the I-515 improvements. We will see some impactful closures along 515 in the coming days and weeks. The Eastern Avenue off-ramp from southbound 515 will be closed five weeks beginning this Sunday night, April 17th. Uh, the closure is necessary to add a much needed second lane to the off-ramp. On Tuesday, May 10th and Wednesday, May 11th, northbound 515 will be closed between Casino Center and I-15 from 11 p.m. till 6 a.m. The following night, Thursday, May 12th, southbound 515 will be closed between Casino Center and I-15 from 9 p.m. until 5 a.m. the following morning. The viaduct uh, rehabilitation project is scheduled to be completed by year's end. And that concludes the director's report. Are there any questions of Mr. LaRue? Any comments? I'm anxious to continue to monitor the work of the advisory group and I'm glad to see that the land use uh, fees are being considered as something that should be addressed at a local level. I think that uh, many municipalities, for example, Henderson, uh, you know, we have a WIFNA and a PIFNA, so we actually have fees that are uh, uh, attached to properties in specific areas to address some of those concerns for, for growth and development. And my concern would be, too, that uh, economic development could be impacted if you start assessing a lot of fees to a project that you may see a developer or a, a project choosing to go to another state instead of Nevada if the fees um, on a particular piece of property are too great. So thank you for considering that. Um, MJ, any? Thank you, you Chairman. <clears throat> so your next item is to approve the consent agenda, uh, consent agenda, which consists of items five through 40 and can be taken in one motion. Can I have a motion to accept the consent agenda? So we have a motion on the floor. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed say nay. And that motion carries. <laughs> Thank you, Chairwoman. 
the next item is agenda item 41. It's to receive information on the May 2022 Arts City Board of Commissioners meeting. And as we do every year, um, because of um, our future uh, final budget presentation to you, we'll ask to move the May meeting from Thursday, May 12th to Thursday, May 19th. Thank you. And to be consistent with what we just did with regional flood, can I have a motion to move the meeting to May 19th? We have a motion on the floor. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Anyone opposed say nay. And that motion carries. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, the next item, agenda item number 42, is to receive a presentation on the tentative budget for fiscal, fiscal year 23 and direct the RTC Department of Finance to submit the tentative bu budget to the Nevada Department of Taxation by April 15, 2022. And Mark Trosdall, our CFO, will present that to you. Thank you, Mr. Trosdall. Thank you. Um, good morning, Madam Chair and members of the Commission. Our uh, fiscal 23 budget will start out with looking at our funding sources. On this chart, you can see that our sales tax is our largest funding source, uh, about 34% of our funding. We're budgeting sales tax at $291 million in uh, fiscal 23. Then we look at fuel taxes at about $203 million which is about 24% of our budget. And then we go down to grants, which we're budgeting at $142 million, or 17% of our funding sources. Then we're also issuing uh, bonds this year, which will benefit next year. So we're looking at using bond proceeds of about $132 million. And then uh, our fair revenue from uh, transit makes up about 7% of our total funding sources. We're budgeting those at about $56 million uh, in fiscal 23. This chart is a historic depiction of our sales tax collections. You can see in uh, fiscal 22 that we have a significant increase uh, in what we're projecting at $282 million. Um, fiscal year to date, January 2022, we've had an increase of uh, $41 million already in uh, sales tax year over year, which is a 33.4% increase. So this year we're um, projecting about a 22% overall increase over fiscal 21. And then in fiscal 23, we're uh, budgeting three and a half percent increase over 22. And that's kind of our standard uh, increase as we project sales tax. Then one eighth of a percent of the sales tax um, goes to streets and highways. And from that, we deduct 16% uh, for the uh, Clark County Department of Environment and Sustainability. Our total budget for that one eighth of a percent of sales tax is almost $73 million in fiscal 23. We go to transit uh, funding sources, you can see here that uh, our sales tax makes up over 50% of our funding sources for transit, and that's the three-eighths of a percent uh, of sales tax. You can see here that we're budgeting uh, capital grants at $90 million and uh, operating grants at almost $45 million. And here you can see that our fair uh, revenue is uh, 56.7 million or about 13.4% of our funding uses for transit. And then uh, fuel tax revenue, this chart depicts our fuel tax revenue for our motor vehicle fuel tax, also our FRI fuel tax. And you can see here that we're budgeting 203.5 million for fiscal 23. We're estimating fiscal 22 to come in at about $14.3 million higher than 21, or a 7.7% increase, and we're budgeting a 2.2% increase for fiscal 23. Then our fair revenue uh, for the transit system, you can see here that we've, uh, it was impacted significantly by the pandemic. Uh, we're estimating uh, fiscal 22 uh, to come in at about 72% of fiscal 19, which was pre-pandemic. And then we're budgeting uh, 55.4 million in fiscal 23, anticipating uh, more recovery of our ridership and transit. We'll move to our funding uses. 
As you can see here again, we're budgeting $841.4 million total in uh, fiscal 23, and over 50% of our budget is capital outlay. And then uh, contracted services, we're budgeting 270 million or 32% of our total budget um, for contracted services, and that's mostly our uh, transit service. And then debt service, we're budgeting at 91.1 million or almost 11% of our funding uses. Salaries and benefits are budgeted at about 6% or 51 million um, for total funding uses. And then we go to capital outlay, and you can see here that we're budgeting $310 million for road work for, and you see all the, uh, the cities uh, represented uh, in the county, our jurisdictions down here at the bottom. So we're uh, investing, we're budgeting about 310 million next year for that. And then transit is budgeted $117.5 million or 27% of our capital outlay. A significant project that uh, we're working on now uh, is Maryland Parkway BRT. We are in our 23 budget, we have uh, $16 million budgeted for that project. And then in fiscal 24, we're estimating that we'll spend about $90 million on that project for Maryland Parkway BRT. The transit capital budget, we're budgeting $117 million and of that 90.2 million is grant funded. And here uh, is some highlights of that uh, transit capital budget. Um, we're budgeting uh, for hydrogen buses, uh, four 60-foot hydrogen buses for $6.7 million. Um, we're also budgeting for hydrogen uh, fueling equipment at $2.6 million. And then we're also budgeting for four 40-foot electric buses uh, next year for $4 million. And we're also budgeting for uh, 32 60-foot compressed natural gas buses. And we're also budgeting for uh, shelters and safety enhancements uh, to our system for about $16 million. We're also budgeting for some facility improvement and uh, equipment upgrades for $9.1 million next year. And then also technology upgrades of about $19.4 million. Then this chart shows us uh, our outstanding bonds. Uh, it, for 22, we're uh, looking at 872 million outstanding on our bonds. And that includes a, 20, a $200 million bond issue that will uh, sell this month and then close next month in May. And then 23, after some uh, uh, principal payments, we're anticipating a balance of 818 million and our uh, main objective here is to only borrow when we need to and uh, use most of the money as pay go. So we just uh, pay out of revenue and hopefully decrease our interest expense. Then we look at transit funding uses and you can see here the majority of that is contracted services at almost $240 million. Then again, we've covered the capital outlay at $117 million and salaries and benefits at 22 million. And then we do make a $12.6 uh, million transfer to our administrative fund. Our fixed uh, route contract cost, we're anticipating that we'll spend about $123 million in fiscal 22, and we're budgeting $132 million in fiscal 23. And you can see here on, with our fixed route service hours that uh, we're budgeting uh, 1.8 uh, million hours in fiscal 23. And we've drawn an arrow in there or a line to kind of show you the trajectory we were on previous to the pandemic. We're still well below that trajectory in, in our uh, forecasted 22 and then our budgeted 23 number. Then our paratransit contract, uh, we're anticipating uh, that that will cost us about $46 million in fiscal 23, um, which isn't quite back up to our peak in uh, fiscal 19 at $47.2 million. 
And then our uh, transit security cost, we're budgeting $13.6 million. We anticipate a new contract uh, for security and also uh, additional officers and better technology. That's, uh, that explains the increase in uh, that uh, budget item there. Then our transit uh, fuel cost, we're uh, budgeting $6.9 million in 23 and estimating about $6 million in 22. We've added about 17% to those estimates uh, based on current uh, increases in cost of gas and fuel. And those are my prepared remarks for the budget for fiscal 23. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Commissioners, questions, comments? Yeah, I, I have a comment. Um, I had the honor of participating in the finance committee uh, and learned a lot and had interesting discussion about hedging. <laughs> but I just wanted to comment that I wholly support the submission of this of this budget to, to the uh, uh, Nevada Department of Taxation. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Commissioner? Yes, um, are you seeing the, the strip route that is our revenue source coming back? Or? Yes, it's a, it's actually f still far. We're we're about uh, fifty percent uh, of where we were pre-pandemic. Revenue-wise, we're we're seeing a better increase. But the the good news is, uh, in the the latest uh, weeks and months, we've seen a sharp increase. Wonderful. Have we explored on that front? Um, whether there's value to uh, a route that goes to the back of the house for employees, do we see a demand for if we were to provide a connective service to the back of the house that employees might take it and, and get them out of their cars? And yes, we're actually working with the Culinary Union and Angela's team right now to uh, to do a study and focus groups with uh, with workers to see what we can do to, to do a workforce mobility connection to the back of the house. Wonderful. Thank we you. just heard, uh, uh, to continue on that, we just heard back from, uh, the, so the Culinary Union, uh, they've been great to work with. They sent out a survey and we received quite a bit of information from the culinary workers, so we'll work uh, to understand really what their needs are and, and because to your point, Mayor, that, that that could be something to consider. Wonderful, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Can I have a motion to approve uh, and move forward the, the uh, report? Thank you. Can we have a motion on the floor. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed say nay. And that motion carries. Thank you, Chairman. The next item is, is to receive informa information from our legal counsel. Counsel and good news is that we don't need uh, awesome. to discuss anything uh, in legal in nature. So we can move on to our last agenda item, which is to conduct your final citizens participation period. Thank you. This is the second time set aside for public comment. Anyone wishing to speak to the board, now is your opportunity. Please come forward to the microphone, provide your name and your comments and uh, for the record. Uh, do we have any comments? Thank you. Hi, good morning. Um, Madam Chair, Commission members, uh, MJ, and your outstanding team. My name is Sandy Hill. I'm a Vice President for Keolis, and on behalf of the entire Keolis team, I just want to thank you for the decision relative to the retention bonuses in appreciation of the workers who so diligently continue to work um, during such challenging times. So we are grateful uh, for the decision and also grateful for the partnership. So thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak at this time? Seeing no one, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>